Folks, welcome inside the Parisi Palace, high above 3773 East Broadway. This is a live edition of the Jake Feinberg Show, Comedy on Power Talk. Please go to our website, powertalk.live. Download our free app to your smartphones. You can stream all of our live local programming, including Solomon on Blast, the Jim Parisi Show, and yours truly, the Jake Feinberg Show. Can't thank you enough for making us part of your day today, and... um, it's a high honor to bring on my next guest, a guy who is um, spoken of very highly by some of the baddest cats in the world, like David Garibaldi. <laughs> um, he's been, he's been, you know, finding a way to uh, keep his own individual sound um, in the studios in the midst of a time in music, in, at least in this host's mind, of conformity, uh, when technology in some ways has superseded the humanity in music. Um, I guess continues to try to keep the heartbeat in the music, and I look forward to exploring that with him today. John J.R. Robinson, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Hey, Jake, uh, and, and your whole audience. Uh, it's my pleasure and honor to be a, a part of this great show. I love you, buddy. Hey, man, I love you too, man. Thank you for being part of the show. I, Like I told you, I, um, I had my book coming out. Um, it just came out today, and I, I mean, it's my first book, so I, it, I was thinking over here, I'm like, am I going to ask J.R.? Not your, my question is, what was the first formative session? I mean, like Gadsden told me he's like, he was starving to death in L.A. And, you know, like Charles Kennard was like asking Carol, uh, Carol Kay if he could get him some work at Motown. And, you know, he was on like right. this album with Charles Kennard. I mean, what was the first sort of, like, were you ever starving to death in L.A.? What was the first formative album you were on, you know? Well, I mean, that, that starving thing, that's a second question. But um, <laughs> the, uh, you know, growing up in Iowa, there were no recording sessions. So when I moved to Boston um, in 73, so I started doing sessions there. But I, th- those don't count. You know, those are just like you know, little learning, learning platforms. So when I got to Los Angeles with uh, Rufus, uh, we, we were in the studio, but we weren't working for 11 months. So... During those eleven months, nobody knew who the who the hell I was, and so I, I would I would go to Balboa Park in Encino and hustle basketball to make money. I love this, my God. So I I, I met this 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 dude named Tommy who dollars. So I go okay. I'm like you know I was always a really good basketball player in the younger days. So I would do that in between when Rufus wasn't. Uh, you know, in, in the studio. Uh, you know, this is now... Uh, Shock had already left us in 1978. Uh, so, at that same time, I get a call, my very first session outside um, Rufus, with right. a guy named Joe, Joe Chimay. And Joe Chimay is a famous bass player who moved uh, to Nashville when the earthquakes came. And I used to do all sorts of television and and stuff with Steve Dorff and uh, different uh, artists with Joe. Um, but he had a solo record because he was one of the background singers with Pink Floyd. Wow. And he was a great bass player. Jeez. And so so he, he goes, yeah, I'd really like, like you to play on my record. So, I mean, I, I don't think the record did shit, but uh, it was the first... <laughs> Hall outside of the you know the triangle of, uh, of uh, you know of the Rufus band. So well, but uh, let's not. I mean, let's not sell it, cut yourself short here. I mean, I want to. There was a cat that I interviewed a while back, and I actually got to visit him um, in in uh, Louisiana. It was uh, Herschel Dwellingham, and he did. Oh wow! Okay, so Dwellingham used to cook with uh, I think Grady Tate. Gave him some gigs uh, on the on the in Cape Cod around the same time that you were in Boston, and he was doing jingle work. So I'm actually thinking that those Boston sessions have a lot more legitimacy than you may think they do. And I just kind of wanted you to why were you re, why were you in Boston, and and can you can you talk a little bit about uh, you know some of the work that you were doing there? Yeah, Boston. I mean, you know, I graduated high school uh, from a town called Creston, Iowa in uh, 73 and and uh, you know during like junior high i had start i had studied i'd gone around to all these jazz uh, jazz camps and the national stage band camps and i'd met ed sof and ed sof sure oh um, man a great drummer extremely man extremely instrumental and to me uh, to this day 
um, and I've had Alan Dawson as a teacher, was is, is the best drum teacher on the planet. Show, show, is, yeah, is, yeah. Ed Sofer. Uh, he, he was so Ed, a chess cadet, right? So, is he chess cadet cat? From where? Was he was he doing the chess cadet records? I'm trying to figure who who I, he, or was he, he doing? He was with Cl uh, Clark Terry and uh, Woody Herman. Woody Herman, uh, Woody Herman's band. That's right. Yeah, got it, got it. And you know he was a little, a little more aggressive than those other drummers. He he, he had a bigger bigger chip. And um, but and Ed, you know when I met him, I was young, so I started to idolize this guy. He got me out of some bad habits, you know, because I started playing drums when I was seven. And he, he, you know, instead of playing all the way heel up, he had me playing heel down and and releasing the beater off the bass drum head and those sort of things. And 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 really concentrating on time. And I was very blessed. But at the same time, I'd ask him, well, you know, I'm in, the, I'm in southwest Iowa. I can just go down I-35 and be in North Texas State and boom, and I can go back home, you know, and see my parents on holidays. Uh, he goes, no. He goes, you should go to Berkeley. And I go, okay. And I'm, you know, thinking about my dad's paycheck. <laughs> so uh, I go, uh, Ed says I should be going to Berkeley. He goes, okay. So I applied and uh, moved to Boston in 73 and, you know, uh, started meeting cats all around the world. And, and you know, we, we, uh, we did do some, some sessions. And, I mean, I actually did a, a, a doctorate session for one of our teachers, uh, Robert Horace, uh, who got his doctorate in Indiana. But we, we did all the recording at Berkeley. And then I became the, the the recording drummer my second semester at Berkeley, which was, I believe, because of my time and uh, reading. Wait. So, so let me ask you a question. So you were right. I'm not selling it. No, I, guess, I mean, this is where the rubber meets the road for, 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 for Jake Feinberg. I, I mean, you're telling me that uh, um, the, there, when you say you were the recording drummer at, at Berkeley, what, what exactly does that – I mean, re, I, I've seen records – Quincy Jones records on uh, pressed on a Berkeley label. Did, was there actually a label there? I mean, were you were you cutting? No, records? not in those days. Uh, in those days, we were doing um, like mu music minus one records. Oh, so, wow! You know, MMO, so, uh, yeah, so, definitely. So a sax player could, you know, bl you know, kind of like Jamie Abersold records. So, so you could uh, sax player or, or trumpet player could blow over changes while he's got an actual rhythm section with him. But I think that was only. Only for the school, if I'm not mistaken. First time I'd ever heard a click track or even knew what a click track was. You know, JR, I want to read you. Um, I just pulled up this this quote from my interview with Herschel. And I want to, because this is the special thing about your generation, uh, you know, and what is the conundrum now with, in my mind, um, music is now really being made, vocabulary of music is being made in academia and and even though you went to berkeley uh, the music was uh really still being made on the streets and there was you know you had the combat zone i'm sure you were down there a little bit oh god yeah okay so i mean i'm just just read this and then you can riff on it i mean and ex as experientially you can take it from your point of view um dwellingham said he goes if alan couldn't do a gig he would give them to me peggy lee was performing out at the Cape, in, out in Cape Cod, Cape Cod at the Sheraton Hotel, she came with Grady Tate playing the opening night. The second night, Alan Dawson played for two nights. I was playing with Jimmy Hamels in the lounge. He brought wow. Grady over to hear me. I could see the two of them sitting there smiling. I'm thinking, what the hell is Grady Tate here looking at me for? When I get off the bandstand, Alan says to Grady, Herschel can play the rest of the week with Peggy Lee. I looked at him and said, huh? He said, I want you to play with the big orchestra the rest of the week. I was going... I was going to go back to Boston, and a guy named Phil Barbosa was the leader of the band. He said, yep. you, you ain't going nowhere. You're working here the rest of the summer. I played behind Jose Feliciano, all the artists that came in. And that's the point is that, you know, that's Herschel's story. But I have to believe that, Jr. you were getting, I mean, most of your experience. The, Harvey Mason said the same thing. I mean, Alan Dawson was like, they were playing, like, rhythm games together. It wasn't like, I don't know, I mean... How much experiential learning did you get, even in college? Uh, oh, it was it was um, just overwhelming, and um, th well, and this is why when I first got there, and ironically, my dad dumped all my shit on the side of Mass Avenue and said bye and drove <laughs> off, and I never saw him again. Are you serious? You know, you're, you're you're on your own, oh, buddy. Oh, jeez. And I go, oh 
oh, shit. And, I, you know, I'd never been in a big city, you know. I came from small town USA. Mm. So, anyway, after time goes by, you start meeting people, and people are introducing themselves to you. And, and uh, I ended up getting, um, uh, well, I mean, you remember the drummer Joe Hunt, one of the great educators. Dude, Berkeley. you know who, yo, dude, by the way, man, that dude's still cooking the groove. And, uh, <laughs> And, and Philly, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, and and you know who you know who grew up with him and and learned, I mean he was older than this guy, but he was wearing shades at night. Joe Hunt was wearing shades at night, and 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 a young Harold Jones, Tony Bennett's drummer, oh, you know, oh, um, yeah. was in the back of the car. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead, Joe Hunt. Go ahead. Well, you know, I'm, I I was working with um, you know in the North End with just a, just a beautiful. Uh, Italian band. Oh. It was absolutely great. Jeez, that's you know, so, awesome. And I'm starting to make some dough finally, and uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, you know, Joe sees me in the hallway. He goes, uh, "What are you doing uh, next weekend?" I go, <laughs> "Nothing." You know, I'm not even studying with the guy. You know, mm. and, and uh, I always, re- you know, Joe always reminded me of like the uh, like a white elephant. <laughs> you know, in yeah. the way he played. I just that's that's how I kind of interpreted it in the old days, but. He goes, hey, do you want to want to uh, sub for me on this gig? Uh, her name's Lynn Stewart, and I go, oh, I'd love to, man. Where is it? He goes, well, it's at the Colonnade, which is you know like Boston's best hotel. I go, oh boy, I don't even know if I own a suit. <laughs> and uh, but I, I said, sure, man, I'll, I, I'd love to do. It. He goes, you'd be great for this gig. And I go, okay, well, I go there and I find out that Lynn Stewart is Chick Corea's cousin. Holy cow! And she's a pian- pianist, a vocalist, jazz singer. And I can't remember who was on Upright. Uh, that's a um, shame. That is, this is unbelievable. I went to Boston University, so I, I, I did. I'm a Boston cat. I, I mean, I, I, this is an epic story. What was it? Uh, anyway, besides the Upright part, had you been had you been comfortable working? Was it the first time you were really working with a singer? No, God, no. No, I mean, you know, gr- growing up in Iowa, I had all, multiple bands, and I also sang in all my bands, so I was... I, 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 so that I wasn't, yeah, that wasn't the, yeah. So this was just more like, you know, nice hotel, paying gig, Chickory's yeah. cousin. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you know, Yoho is out in the audience and shit. <laughs> and, 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 and it was, you know, it's like, you, you know, if you look at life today, it was the same thing. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. I'm working with great singers, great artists, and there's Yoho's out in the audience. It, nothing. Which is, you know, and something I mean that in the nicest of ways. Because did you um, like? Uh, let's see. You know, we have a game on this program called uh, "Name That Voice," and I want to I want to put this this clip in for you, and then uh, and come back and we'll and we'll break it down. All right, cool. Well, you know, I was familiar with Coltrane before I actually got a chance to play with him because uh, he uh, I've been listening to the record so. Um, you know, he was already recognized as, a, as a, quite a force. Um, but what 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 uh, Coltrane was able to do um, musically, I, I got the opportunity to sit, sit in with him at a small club that the quartet was playing at in Chicago called McKee Fitzgerald <clears throat> because Elvin had hadn't returned for the last set of the show uh, the evening, so. I had been playing. The owner knew me, and I played. The, uh, he, he knew that I played really pretty well, and uh, I played the jam sessions uh, on the uh, couple of nights that they had them. And so uh, the place was packed and late, and uh, you know he wanted John to play. And so he asked John to let let me play with him. So Coltrane didn't say. Hey, you know, no, he just shook his head, and we went up and we played three or four numbers. And uh, for me, it was, uh, uh, you know, it was just trying to keep my cool when I'm up on the stage playing with him. Fortunately, I, you know, I could hold my own. <laughs> and I had been practicing with the records. And right, so right, right, right. Material. So, you know, it was a trust. Uh, first of all, there was a trust thing. He didn't say, can this guy play? He just, he trusted. There was mm-hmm. this trust. There was, there was an air of, okay, we'll go up and we'll play. And uh, McCoy and uh, Jimmy 
you know, didn't look at me weird. And obviously I was doing okay. I was, you know, nobody looked at me funny. I was holding my own. But playing with Train, I realized why Elvin played as intensely as he did because Coltrane was like a magnet. He was like a chain. You know, he literally, whatever you could throw at him, he, uh, he could soak it up like a sponge. He was um, a conscious, uh, you know, a, a, a continuous stream of conscious, creative consciousness. But it, it was, he was more like, he was like a sort of a preacher. It was almost like in church, you know, it was like it, each set, you know, you think, you know, couldn't get any higher. And it would go higher, it would continuously evolving, going higher, higher, and higher. So for me, it was uh, uh, it was a real highlight of my life, you know. But, you want to take a guess at who that is? Man, I I, I don't want to stumble. Is that Roy? You know, it's a, I interviewed Roy, but he's not much of a talker. That was uh, that was another. I mean, it was Jack Dejanet. Oh, is that Jack? Yeah, was, oh, my God. Yeah, so, I should have known. Well, it's okay. Oh, Listen, you, you're off the hook. I, you know, here's the point, JR. I, I, I really want you to break this down because I have my I am not a professional musician. I mean, I play drums. I've felt the four-way coordination. I understand right. how to let the body dance. I love you guys because you go there with me. But, you know, Coltrane... Um, you know, there's he is part of American lore, but really, the he was fusing, and I don't want to say he was the only one, but you know what Jack said in another part of this interview that I did with him was that he really was the one that put the ohm or the spiritual part of of he put spiritual he fused spirituality with jazz, and I want I want to know when you really. If you could talk about that, an experience on the bandstand, I'm sure you played Paul's Mall or the Jazz Workshop when you were in Berkeley or something. Even so, when did you get touched by the spirit playing music? And the reason I asked you that is that I see a lot of cats, my generation, I'm a Gen Xer at 41, and obviously there's right. younger cats, and they're going through a lot of formula trips. We're very hung up on perfection. It takes us 40 minutes to get a bass drum sound. In in the past, it was just like you had to round this stuff out and just and burn. You, you didn't have a lot of time to think. And then once you knew your apparatus, you could bring in, I don't know, I want you to talk about the spiritual quality of music and when you really got touched by that. Well, and, and, and just as a, for, a, a, a forethought to that, you remember those early videos of Tony? Absolutely, setting up, absolutely. Setting up his, his bass drum is still not in place. <laughs> exactly. He gets his bass drum in place, boom, they go. Right. You know, and, right. and it's like, right. it's like, I just had to, you made me think of that. But, you know, I've been playing so long now, thanks to God. Yeah, and, I know, uh, I know, I know. And, and also, I guess God gave me a brain, and, and my, I had great parents, so the... You know, my, my early, like, uh, emotional connections were things like when I was really little and listening to uh, Brown Sugar <laughs> and, and listening to how simplistic that drum part is, yet there's something about that drum part that, man, if you ain't dancing, then you're dead. Yeah, right, right, right. So, you know, you know cut to... You know, I'm sure there were many, many times in Boston, but when I first joined Rufus and Chaka Khan, and and they actually came and sat in with my band in Cleveland, Ohio, when I was on the road, and that experience, when the whole band came out of the, their party mode and got on stage and plugged in, and I knew that shit, you know, like the back of my hand anyway, and... When, and then Chaka comes up, and I, I realized this is the new band, and and then we started touring. Uh, that was the exciting part. I mean, I couldn't wait to go to Soundcheck. You know, I mean, <laughs> gig was a whole other story. You know, and you know today nobody likes to Soundcheck and and uh, right. that sort of thing. So I mean, that I think the that first religious experience for me was uh, Rufus and Chaka Khan. Was it now? Okay, let's break it down. I mean, obviously it was. Your first mate. I mean, first of all, you were what kind of band? What were you playing? A funk big band in in, in Cleveland? That's were you singing and playing? What kind um, of I, uh, I was fortunate enough to actually hire singers. So yeah, it's, I, yes, it's it unreal. Was, it, it, it was an eight piece uh, sh show band 
I had a black chick named Janet Tyler, who I'm still in touch with. Oh, my uh, God. Just a great singer. I oh. actually brought her into the Quincy Jones band at one point. Um, oh, this is fantastic. And, you know, we, had, we had horns, you know, we'd, we'd cover, you know, Earth, Wind uh, to the stylistics. And, uh, and 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 all the rock shit too. So let me ask you though, this a, is the question for with 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 Rufus and Shaka because I'm not it's not I'm not deep in that bag. So I need you to was it was it scintillating because you guys never played the same song the same way once? Was it different uh, every time? Is that why it was? Re- I'm looking for this because to me, you know, I mean Kenny Barron when I I've done several interviews and he was like you know. My whole mission at this point playing live is to touch people's hearts. He's like, the first time my heart was touched, you know, I went to the showboat in Philadelphia and I saw Elvin and Train go for 40 minutes back and forth and they didn't repeat one idea. That was the point. It was right. like, not one re- re- repeated. So with Root, was it a, I, I, was it just the exhilaration of being with an outfit like that and knowing that it was really a serious professional gig or was it the fact that every night, you never played the same song the same way once. It, it was both. <laughs> it was both because, I, I mean, first of all, you have a shell of a song. Right. So the, so the, so the song has to, and, and you have a, a world-class vocalist selling that shell. Well, you know, Shaka was going through her jazz phase. Right. And there, there would be times where, you know, on the bus, she would just be singing me Coltrane lines or Miles Davis lines. <laughs> she'd just be looking at me going, and just and starting like to, she'd riff off herself. Wow, that is And then go back to the back of the bus. <laughs> and, and so so that that would continue during certain songs that modally uh, uh, accepted that experimentation. Wow. Uh, obviously, there's certain songs that you have to do um you know, per block um, to, to make it sound right. But in my case, I, I definitely, I, I would have a, a, um, an outline of the groove, but I would definitely alter it with different kind of ghost notes, maybe a different, uh, a dig. Uh, dig. you know, a thing like, you know, and tell me something good when it has the breakdown of everybody right. grunting. You know, there was different times for experimentation. So um, I, I think it was the best of both worlds with that band. You know, we, we didn't need Pro Tools. You know, when, when we toured with the, the last tour we did was with Earth, Wind, and Fire during the, uh, the 9-11 time. And, uh, you know, we would uh, set up in front of them and come out and plug in like a rock band. I enjoyed that. Can you, you just, I'm sorry, the Skype dropped there. You, you, you said you plugged in in front of them and what? Say that, that was very important. And, and just blew, and just blew, just played like a rock band. And just played like a rock band. You know, I, I mean, we are marinating here with J.R. Robinson on the Jake Feinberg Show. I needed to ask you about this cat, because uh, he's one of my favorite drummers, uh, and I never met him, and I've only heard him on a couple of records. This guy named Harry Blazer. Oh my God! Yeah, Blazer and a- see Abel Boreal, legendary. I mean, my my man, most beautiful cat ever. They were, I mean, because they were the, they were at Berkeley the same time you were. No, they, excuse me. They were there the generation before me. Are you sure? Because they were talking. To, you're right. Because I, I'm looking at this quote here, and they were getting off on. Uh, well, the, the record that they were really work shedding in the basement was Sissy Strut, you know, the meter stuff. So that was late 60s. You're right. They were a little That's bit right. before you, a little bit before you. Unbelievable. Unbe- yeah, and I, and I uh, you know, obviously have played with Abe Sr. many times, in, you know, including like Just Once from Quincy Jones, you know, where we won, we won the Grammy. That's Abe. And, uh, <laughs> Abe, Abe and I did a whole bunch of playing together. Uh, Harry, I met... But, you know, a lot of those guys, you know, like Harvey, you know, once once they graduated or they were done, they were done. They were done. And that was, uh, you know, kind of a uh, sad thing. But still, that school at that time, you know, Ernie Watts came out of there. and uh, Dude, I've interviewed, uh, I, listen, I the, the great Dick Burke, rest in peace, I've interviewed. Gene Perla oh, was yeah. there, Jan Hammer, Alan Broadbent. I've done it all. You're from a, you're from a little, what's cool is that, um, you kind of just are in the truly 
the erogenous zone of music for Jake Feinberg is 1973. So you, the fact that your dad dropped all your stuff on Mass Ave in 73, to me, that was that was a blessing. And I mean, did you get to play Paul's Mall ever? That was the tripped out thing, too, is that it was like that would be today. I mean, that's the whole thing, JR. Explain this to me and my generation, okay? And I'll give you a few examples. Woodstock. I just did a, a q and I, I hosted an event in, in the Mission District with Greg Rico and Michael Shreve, and we did a, a, a revisiting of Woodstock. Over, uh, this is over in July, and uh, both good friends of mine. And they, I mean, Carlos Santana did not have a record out um, right. <laughs> before Woodstock. Bill Graham gave the promoter two different bands to choose from on analog, and he chose Santana. There's another example that I, my brain can't hit right now, but the point is that, like, take Paul's Mall, for example. I mean, you'd have students filling in for people at places that today, you, I mean, you have to have a resume today. Back then it was right. like, hey, you know what? I mean, you know, it, I don't even, why was it like that? I mean, why were we not that uptight? I, it, to me, it's like, eventually the lockdown came in. I mean, I understand that the the studio scene was... To, in my mind, it seemed like it was really large. In reality, it really wasn't that large. It was pretty. It was pretty. Uh, guys had lockdown, but you know there were pockets of rhythm sections, and more importantly, guys like Tom Donahue, Bill Graham, the list, Bob Thiel. Um, you know, all these guys. It, it was like it really was about what their label stood for. I'm jumping around to labels versus live shows and things like that. It just it seemed to me that. The gateway to new music was allowing cats who had no reputation to get on the bandstand, and I'm sure some people fell on their face, but a lot of people didn't and made made careers out of it. And today, it's like, you know, if you don't have a pedigree, you won't even get paid attention to. Well, I mean, how do, can you take us through that evolution? Well, I got to tell you that in those days, look at the number of musicians that there were compared to today, That's, which is yeah. so-called musicians. Yeah, right. You know, these people, there's people today, and I'm not, and I'm not going to sell the ones that have really studied. There's some unbelievable great jazz players out there today that have, that have taken this culture and modal thing and, and, and mastered it, but not like the, the, the author. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. It's a, it's, so, you can't, so you can't copy that you, stuff. Yeah. No, you can't. I mean, maybe the Joshua Redmond may be the, the last one, and he's got how old is he now? He's yeah. shit. He's in his 50s. So, um, so in, back in those days, if, if there were some students that were playing Paul Small or Jazz Workshop, uh, they deserved it. You know, it, it was, their time was going to come anyway. I and, dig, I dig. And I, I used to go, I used to go, I never got to play those two clubs. Uh, but I, I, I went there religiously <laughs> to see, of course, Billy Cobham and uh, the... My two good friends, Dick Oates and Joe Morrissey, two of the trumpet players, were on that band because I used to play with the Iowa Big Band when I was a kid. And um, they were all, and including Dick Oates was on that band. And so, Hold on, I, want, I just want to, be, I want to be clear. You, you saw Billy with Dreams or with Mahavishnu? Uh, with Billy Cobham. With Billy? And the, oh, and, and the Brecker Brothers. Oh, and, and oh, no, the Billy Cobham band with the... Uh, with, with, uh, with the Brecker Brothers. And, and Abercrombie and those cats. Yeah. That's on, right. Wow. Wow, that music! And, uh, that music is still. I watched sh- Billy break his second or third rack tom during a solo. Oh, he broke the head, and I'm thinking, <laughs> he broke a fucking head! I, I can't believe it. And he he started throwing his giant 808 fucking Promark sticks in it, and then bashing them out so they'd fly out into the audience. Like, no. You know, that's some shit Joe Jones would have done, maybe. But oh my um, god, that's... I was just I was blown. Away. But Getting back to the Chase situation, um, you know, they had a huge band. It was like a nine-piece uh, horn band where the fourth trumpet part had double high Cs in it. That's right. That's and, right. Uh, yeah. So, I, you know, I knew these guys. They became friendly, and, you know, they they, they were asking me, do you want to join this band? And, and uh, you know, I sat there with my cousin Mark, and it, it was almost like that Max L commercial where your hair is just slicked back. <laughs> Yeah, 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 dude. I love that, dude. Band. I love Max LXL2 is the dudes in the chair blowing the, back, dude. Uh, that's what a great ad. Whoever made that ad was a genius, genius. dude. Genius. And, and uh, so we're sitting there. I'm just like, oh my God, this is great. And then uh, I find out, you know, they start touring the Midwest a couple of weeks later. 
and Bill and the guys that did not live in Iowa crashed and died. Oh, and I'm going, holy fuck. My dad had called me in Boston and, and told me this, and I'm like, oh, geez, well, so so much for playing with Bill Chase. Right. And uh, Wow, I didn't, I didn't realize that that's how that – because that band was – was really on the up and up. I didn't realize there was, uh, you know, and that, and that was not, that happened to a few bands. That happened to Curtis Mayfield's rhythm section and a few bands right. that happened. But I want to go back to something here. You you talk about, I, I, I'm with you on this. I To me, um, you know, you said that if cats were playing uh, the Jazz Workshop or Paul's Mall, um, they had earned, they were on their way, right? And and, yeah. and so there was like a, it, it, but there was also this camaraderie amongst the musicians. I mean, you know, where Dwellingham, uh, you know, Alan Dawson's like, yo, you know, let him play the rest of the week with Peggy Lee. I mean, it seemed to me that there were more opportunities to, to gig and, and actually make some dough. And then the younger, the older generation understood the cyclical nature of music, that the only way it's truly going to continue is by passing it along. And I just, right. today, I don't, I mean, like, I respect the fact that I don't have any answers for it, but I don't know how you guys are, other than giving lessons or um, yeah, mentoring, I, 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 there's, I mean, those guys could literally, Joe Hunt gave you a gig. Like, he was like, you need a gig. Here's a gig. I don't. That that doesn't happen today. There aren't enough gigs anymore. And so right, and you, I didn't even a, I didn't even ask him. Exactly. It, that's exactly you know, exactly. Like he's like, yo, Jr. He's like, he's like, yeah, I've heard great things. He's a he's a good guy. I mean, and you know what? He deserves it. I mean, the point was that there seemed to be a brotherhood and sisterhood amongst the musicians. Not that it was all fair. I know people got ripped off, and I know there were plenty of starving geniuses that died. But it just seemed right. to me. That as a, as it related to the accompanists, especially the rhythm sections, it seemed like there was a a, pa- a passing of the baton and an awareness and an understanding of how the music was going to continue. And uh, you know, maybe I guess the best way to say it is, I, uh, Jr. How do you how do you in your own way do that today? You don't need. I mean, you're still playing your ass off. Uh, you know, you're clearly established. But how do you give back in a way that is meaningful and that in a way where you say, well, I know that that my that my God is helping me carry on because music came first. OK, music right. came first and and you have to be able to continue that lineage. And I know there's a supply and demand issue. And I and you said something about this, these so-called musicians now. And I and I know what you're getting at with this idea of like. You know, being able to transcribe everything, they have huge facility and chops. And you know what? And the late great Indugu Chancellor told me, you know, that 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 would just make them fall asleep. You know, watching that stuff. You know, it's like it, it doesn't. Re- you know, you need the feel, you need the soul, and that only comes with experiential learning. How do you give back to the younger generate to the younger cats? Well, and in, uh, and you, I think you were blacking in and out there, but yeah. um, you there now? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, how do you give back okay. to the younger cats? That was the that's basically the question. Well, and I, I real quickly, I just you know, I give my heartfelt. I miss you and Dugu. Uh, yeah, man, what a what a. I mean, dude, seriously, one of the nasty. I mean, I I I don't know if you've been hip to this stuff. You have oh. to these these Hampton Hawes albums from the early '70s that he's on. It's like yeah. nothing I've ever heard. I mean, it's 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 the filthiest drumming I've ever heard in my life. It's unreal. I, I interviewed him when I had my podcast show oh. uh, a couple years ago. Oh. And, uh, and, and drag some shit out of him, you know, from the earlier days. Yeah. He was a freaking jazz drummer, man. Oh, he, through and through. He, he didn't think about being a funk drummer, you know, which George Duke kind of helped, you know, mold Foss. him a yep. little bit. So. He did, yep. Anyway, anyway uh, yeah. your question was about... Um, you know, just, you know it's, get, just about, it's a passing, passing, and, I'd say passing, you know, passing it forward. Not, yeah, not passing it down, but passing it up. How do you pass the baton up? Well, you, you know, I, I, I don't... I, I've been teaching since I was 12 years old, and I don't take on a lot of students these days, but if I find a couple or they find me, we'll do uh, a few lessons. Yes. I won't do a lot of lessons. I won't, like, just milk this shit, and, you know, until it's uh, unmilkable. Um, <laughs> so, it's spoken so, like know, a true right. Iowa guy. That was such an oh, Iowa farm God. thing right uh, there. Dude. Yeah, well, yeah. What, 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 what drummers out there have milked a fucking cow? Anyway, <laughs> Levon, so, Levon Helm did. Yeah. I, yeah, I yeah. know Levon yeah. probably yeah. did. Yeah. But uh, um, 
there's a, the, all these drummers that I've helped are all out there now doing stuff. And, and it's a really rough world today because let's say you're 24 years old, 25 years old, and you're touring with some major country artist uh, or, or some R&B thing. They're not paying you shit. Exactly. You're not getting paid. There's, there's no health insurance on the road or, you know, or liability insurance. There's, you know, a lot of the, the, the kids don't understand business. So, uh, you know, just the, the, the lead singer is getting the, 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 the attention and they're shoving all the other people into, a, you know, some small shitty bus. But nevertheless, they're, 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 they're getting an opportunity to expand their ideas. You know, and that, and, you know, I've been very fortunate to uh, be David Foster's drummer. And, you know, and Quincy's too, but, you know, uh, mostly and recently and also in the future, we do a lot of corporate gigs, and we do a lot of gigs for you know for needy children and sure. and and things like that. That um, uh, it's it's just a really good feeling to to play for things that you know that you know a lot of the rich people are are giving up their bucks to help, and you know, and I need to get their butts on the dance floor. So that's that's I I know what the roles are, and and then that that's a very good feeling. Um. You know, when do you do you play games with these drum? I mean, these drummers that you take on, um, it's not like you really. I don't know. I remember the Harvey Mason saying, you know, like Dawson's like, I really can't teach you anything, so let's just play. Ga-. I mean, he'd get on vibes, and Harvey would play drums, or they'd switch back and forth, and just, right, that's what uh, Alan and I did. Yeah, exactly. And and is that is that the kind of? I mean, what is the most? I mean, because when you say I take on students. You know, my generation will immediately. I'm just thinking like Jr. in a suit, you know, on the at the blackboard, pointing to you know uh, polyrhythms or going through some sort of dense theory thing. But what kind of games do you play with these guys? And okay, here's the game. Yeah, uh, th- there's no suit. <laughs> uh, I'm dressed more like a, a beach guy. Yeah, I love but, it. Yeah, um, I dig. Yeah. I, ha- I have a full recording studio in my house, so upon the first hour. Or the first lesson, I get to know the student. I, I listen to the student play maybe 12 different tempos. And sometimes I tell the student exactly what groove to play. Sometimes I, I'll have the student make up the groove. And when, once you allow them to make up the groove is when all, all shit hits the fan. Because these guys, that, that's, that's where all their weaknesses and all their mistakes, eh, it may not be because it's considered a mistake, but... Uh, that's probably the wrong word, but uh, all that shit comes out that needs to be corrected. I want, I'm so sorry. I want. I, I really. I need you to go back and say that is profound. Where you you have them play different tempos, and that's when you. They, yeah. And that I'll have them play like twelve different tempos. Right. You know, I mean, they're going back to uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire at sixty BPM, and they better goddamn well, well be able to play it. <laughs> you know, and not one drummer can sit at 60 BPM, interesting stat. But nevertheless, uh, once I get them comfortable enough that they, they go, okay, I go, okay, are you ready to record now? And they go, well, what? And uh, I always call it the RLS, red light syndrome. Yeah, it's time to go. Don't get, don't well, get, don't once get. once the red light turns on, they freak out. They get, they get scared, and, and this has to do with even life decisions. So what I do is I, I'm also playing psychologist, and I go, no, here's what we're going to do. I'm in the studio. You're out here on the drum set. I'm going to start at 60 BPM. You're going to get quarter note clicks only and have two bars go by, and I want you to play this strict, straight groove. You can add a little bit, but I'll tell them when they can. And I record them, and I record the click on a separate channel. And then, okay, then we go up to 70, and we play, and then we go to 80, and then sometimes I'll do the evens. 90 is quite common. The other common tempos are 100, 104, 116, 120, 126, 124, and 130. And today's contemporary music, those are just common tempos. Mm-hmm. Like all, all this music is all, it's basically the same. So I record them all. And they come in, I go, just take, take a relax. I'm going to shut the click off for a second. You listen to your groove. And you go, oh, well, and I go, that's not bad. That's, that's, that's interesting. That's good. 
And I go, okay, let's go back and put the click in and listen to it. And and and, and all hell has broken loose. The train's off the tracks. Wow. So wow. I'm teaching them. That's intense. Jesus. About what they need to do to actually get into the studio. But at the same time, everybody has their own inner clock. So if they can control their tempos within, you know, we're all human. We're all rushing and dragging. But if they can control it, it's going to make the band feel better, you it, know, with, with, without a click. So that's kind of how I teach. Um, so much stuff is running through my head right now. This is how I, wa I wanted to ask you this. This is really the first thing I wanted to talk to you about, but, you know, we're – we got distracted. It's uh, Mike Clark um, told yep. me this uh, story. He said, when Herbie Hancock made Manchild, I was amazed at how commercial and straight it was. Again, Mike is a bebop, uh, post-bop fanatic, obviously. He's, and, you know, he's known as a funk drummer, but he's just always obsessed with real, real, uh, you know, good, good swing and jazz. He said, I... I said, we sound like a band who needs a singer. We sound like a backup group. Uh, he said, people wow. were starting to use the terms like, this is 75, keep it in the pocket. Drummers were starting to play, this is the key part, drummers were starting to play straight beats. Instead of improvising, they were regulated to playing fills. Whatever fills were on a hit record, other drummers would have to copy them. I've always been a jazz musician, so I was like, no, 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 no. I do not want to go in that direction. I don't care who was going in this direction. I didn't want to go. Playing straight beats. I, now, th I, I know you didn't really get out to – I mean, you were marinating with Rufus and Shaka in 73, and that wasn't the case. But that's – when when all of a sudden FM radio got its teeth in and, and it was like, oh, you know, there was these pop records, and it was like, oh, just play straight beats as opposed to – it seemed to me a lot of individuality within the melodic, uh, the ability of drummers to play melodically went away. And I and I and and when you go back, I mean, when I did before the world caved in on him, I did two hour long interviews with Bill Cosby, and uh, he used to tell me that you know you could put a blindfold on him and put on any Blue Note record, and he could tell Mickey Roker from Pete LaRocca to Tony Williams to. Anybody, he, he, every drummer had their own sound. J.R. Robinson has his own sound. And like this straight beat mentality, is that something that that you came across in the studio to say, well, that person just got a hit, so therefore we have to do the exact same, play straight beats. I don't want to hear all this jazz, you know, all this Philly Joe stuff going on. Do you, do you, do you remember that time in the studio? To me, it was, yeah, it was stifling. I do. Yeah. I, and, 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 and we're going to credit Quincy here. Um, really? Because w when I started becoming his, I met Quincy in 78, and even though I tried to get to his jazz camps when I was a kid, I couldn't, it was too far away. But um, And they were amazing, dude. By Bob James. Uh, Bob James was discovered there. My, by the way, and Quincy and uh, Ray Brown threw uh, disqualified uh, – Michael Brecker for playing "Light My Fire" at one of these things. Uh, it was way too, it was way too, you know, acid rock for them. It was hysterical. Go ahead, continue. Well, listen. When I went to my camps, I got to play with Marion McPartman and Gary Burton and John Laporta. Jeez. So I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Jeez. Here. So, uh, so uh, <laughs> Quincy. Yeah. When, 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 when. Straight beats. When he starts uh, getting the opportunity to produce Rufus and Shaka. So that was uh, early 79. Um, I'm like very happy inside me. And uh, they, you know, he always liked cats that had gone to Berkeley. So I knew that, you know, he could have used Harvey or, you know, some studio drummer uh, at that time. And I wasn't considered a studio drummer at that time. Uh, but he liked me. He goes, oh, no, man, I like the way this guy plays and blah, blah. But once we got into the room, he goes, you know, he's looking at me, too, because, I, you know, I came out of this bebop transformation through Billy Cobham world playing 64th notes and 32nd notes and then coming back to a straight groove. Exactly. And, and he didn't want that. Nor did the guys in Rufus, by the way, simultaneously. And they go, uh, uh, so Quincy goes, just leave your bebop, bebop mentality at home. Wow. And I'm thinking, wow, this is a cat who has gone through bebop, right. but yet, but yet, he's producing rock and roll records now. So uh, the other part of me goes, mm. 
Well, there is work, there is a life after bebop, and and, uh, and we can still and we can still listen to bebop. So I go, well, let's just absorb where this cat's going with this, and he 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 was making a point to still come up with the hippest shit and tying in certain melodical phrases and lines and having great melodies and lyrics without without losing his. In or selling out, he never sold out. What would be? And, what would be? Because I, I mean, being naive and and being birthed in seventy eight, what was? What would be in your mind selling out? Well, I would say seventy nine, and you know, a lot of people think by when he took he took us on. Well, he took the Brothers Johnson on first, sure, in the mid seventies, which I did not play on. But when you listen to Strawberry Letter twenty three. There's some hip shit going on in there. I gotta dig that out. Yeah. Jeez. I gotta uh, dig yeah, that. listen to Strawberry Number Twenty Three, and that was uh, 1975. I think Harvey's playing on it, and um, and then you know we we came around and he produced us, and we had a, it was called Master Jam, and it was a great record, and literally my drums never left the studio and stayed there for Michael Jackson's Off the Wall. It went right into it. And so I would say a lot of people might think that Quincy Jones, was he selling out by doing this Michael Jackson record that took Michael Jackson away from the Jacksons, away from Motown, and over to Epic? And it was this huge just political change of directions. Or was he paving the road for what was about to come of the 80s? And I think the latter is obviously the answer. I think you're spot on. It's funny. I was talking to uh, this amazing finger-picking guitar player, young, young cat in L.A. a few weeks ago, um, William Tyler. He's a brilliant cat. And um, he said, uh, this is, he said to me, he said that there was this Quincy Jones interview that came out last year. He said he went off the rails a little bit, but a lot of the stuff he said was also very profound. There was one line where he said, um, when you start, th- this is what Quincy said, when you start thinking about money, God walks out of the room. And to me, it was more like, I think Quincy, whether or not he saw the writing on the wall, he saw the future of music, if that's, that might be true or not, but I think his intention was to create swinging music that was, you know, let's face it, bebop was not the popular music in 1979. Um, right. So... I think his, you know, he's he's set for life and he's made so many iconic hits, but I don't think, I would be very, I, I would love to talk to him because I think that most importantly, he always recognized, um, you know, let's make art for the sake of art and keep, the, and, and keep the monetary stuff out of it. Obviously, there were political battles and things like that, but like he said, when you, when you start thinking about the money, God walks out of the room. Right, but, right, and even though he... <laughs> Mysteriously, I mean, you know, I played on We Are the World, for example, and we, we all know yeah. that that's the largest selling single of all time. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, which I, I did it for free, but it generated a shitload of dough. So wow. uh, he, he was, uh, you know, and that's also about to go off the rails. So, well, it, it was, uh, it's, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, um, uh, boy, there's so much going through my head here, Jr. You know, let's we got another name that voice. I think you might get this one, and I just want you to enjoy it, and uh, All right. and we'll come back and break it down. Okay, cool. Saying it in a, a bad way, but I mean the way that the rhythm is going. If you listen to that and you check out a lot of the African rhythms, now we're not speaking of the twelve eight stuff, right? Which which, is, which the shuffle came from. You know what I'm saying? What the shuffle come from? Dum 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 dum. James Brown did when he played that. Yeah, rhythm. sure. Yeah. That's you know that's like a from a, that's a twelve eight, you know, uh, situation. You know. Well, he didn't have so it was it was presented a little different on that one. But you if you listen to all the other rhythms and you hear these things, I mean. They, they've added a lot of, uh, you know, percussion in certain ways, in different ways. But the basic rhythm pattern is, uh, you know, hey, it's uh, 
as we say, we, we could use the word maybe hypnotic in a way of speaking, mm-hmm. because it came from a human standpoint. Mm. You know, so I mean, when so when you get human to play it, then it's really it really works. You know, it's really if you say it like it, because I mean, it's part, it's a part of all of us. You know, I mean, you know, even not only the Indians, but the, hey, the Norsemen, the people in uh, the they they had the people out of what, Sweden and Norway the, was the people that came over on the boats. The drums are, are very, you know, they're they're they've been used for centuries, not only in Africa, but they used them, uh, you know, in the middle guys, in the uh, Middle the East. Norsemen, they oh, yeah. had certain things that they played, you know, and the Indians used it, you know, to talk about different things. So it's a very, the very uh. uh uh, well, spiritual in a, fir- in a spiritual sense, uh, say it like that. Yeah, no, and, and, and we're not. All right, Jr. Who do you think that is? Oh my God, uh, he's right on though. Uh, you, um, yeah, you know that that's your buddy. I, I maybe, uh, I mean, a guy you must have crossed paths with and handed up with was uh, James Gadsden. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, it, it, uh, don't worry. You're, there, 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 there are many people that there are there are many people that that struggle with this name, that voice through the phone. But you know, he's what, why is he right? I was trying to get at this idea. I mean, this is a guy who was playing with Hank Ballard and the Midnighters, but the band was obsessed with with modal jazz. So the first set, Hank would let those guys go out on the road and play like free jazz, and then all of a sudden. Right. Gad's back in L.A. with Charles Wright, and Charles is like, don't play field, just play fours. I just want four-four time. I don't want all this crazy melodic stuff. I mean, I guess to the – I mean, is it – from your perch, I don't know what the right word is, but do, is there something to the my thesis that that – Technology has superseded humanity. Even in 79, when you're cutting those records, the technology was there, but it, it wasn't, it had not superseded the humanity in music. And I wonder where, right. if that, if, is there an imbalance in that today in your mind? And, and what do you think, if anything, we need to do in order to correct it? I mean, some people, Charlie Persip would say, <laughs> we need it in order to create new musical vocabulary. Um, we need a, cl- a complete collapse of civilization in order to do that. Um, but, I, you know, from your point of view, what are the things that can allow the heartbeat? Everybody has their own metabolism. I don't care if it was Joe Hunt, Harold Jones, J.R. Robinson, David Garibaldi. Everybody had their own internal time feel. And a lot of that, Rick Murata, we did two interviews, and Murata's like, I'll be sitting in a, in a room and I'll be hearing – some drum beats going on in another room, and I'll say that has to be a machine. And I walk in, and it's a human being p- comping machine parts. Right. That's to me. I I don't want to go tour. I got two young daughters. I don't want to create droids, man. I want to let the body dance. What does well, J.R. Robinson say? Was that? Have you been to Asia? It, many times. I've been to Ta- my my ex wife, Taiwan Taiwanese. Yeah, Taiwan. I've been well, to. That's, that's the beautiful part of Asia. But when you go to China, yeah. It's nothing but robotic or always looking for something that would make the masses like it. So if you look at the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s, and let's just take the billboard charts. Right, right. and And look at what was on there. It was black. It was white. It was the fucking Eagles. It was, it was, uh, uh. Pink Floyd, it was Deep Purple, it was uh, uh, Joni Mitchell, it was Rita Coolidge, it was sure. It, it was it was just a a cross mix of music. Absolutely, all genres. That was, yeah, that, but, yeah, that nobody gave a fuck about race. They they just loved the music. It was you know Motown. It was you know if you want to talk about race wars, let's go the Philly sound and Memphis sound and Motown sound. Exactly. And, but that was all part of what, what I grew up and listening to, then getting into how music was evolving through payola. We had live disc jockeys who would play this new record that we just came out with, or somebody did. It was expected that they would get paid to do this, but there was still a live mechanism to play this new art that everybody wanted. So... 
you know, uh, getting through the 80s, and yes, technology, it wasn't technology that ruined it, because I am living proof that I mastered the technology from the beginning of, you know, I'm, I'm a great synth programmer, I'm a great synth player, and I was always a piano player, and I know how to run any sort of a digital console, and I know how to patch shit, so, and I know how to solder, a, a, you know, and in and out, so this, this is not rocket science. So I just became the master of, of that that was threatening other drummers. And I remember a lot of drummers saying, fuck, we're not working, we're not working. You're doing, you and Jeff are the only two working here in California. And, and Keltner. And uh, like, blah, blah, blah. I go, well, it may have to do with the way you're playing. I'm thinking to myself, you know, maybe your time isn't as good as an LM1 drum machine. Right. I'm right. not going to say it to his face. But I might might have thought it, and so nevertheless, that's part of it. The other part is music and its artistic expression. You know, if you, I just uh, first of all, and you can quote me, I am a vinyl whore. Good. I have I have in my house I have three separate vinyl areas. I gotta I gotta dig through there sometime. I I mean I I have yeah go ahead your 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 vinyl. Well, I whore. could walk into one room. And go into early amplification. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking like right, you know, and, and this will knock your your head off. I just pulled out a record, Tom Brown. Oh. I believe it was his birthday yesterday. Yeah. yeah. And this was 1980 on Arista, Arista Records, Funkin' for Jamaica. If you put that track on, there, it, it's just, it's very simplistic modal fun. They're having a party. Now. That record, you couldn't even sell that record today in, in today's market. Why not? Explain, you know, explain why to the masses. Why, why couldn't? I'm, that's really interesting. Why not? They're looking at, at some Taylor Swift bullshit, right. which all the little teeny girls are you know, aspirating to, to, be, to become like and aspiring. And, and uh, you know, everybody has to be like somebody else because they're all gone. There's no more individuality. That's what and, I'm getting at. That's what I'm getting. That's and, and yeah. So whether whether or whether or not somebody can blow uh, giant steps right over some groove or no groove. God, what would happen if there was no drums on the radio? <laughs> that would be very bad. <laughs> but uh, you know, thank God we're the we're the beginning communicators. But right, uh, yeah. You know, there's there's no there. Uh, there's no way to get paid as an artist. Everybody steals downloads. So my my whole contention is, how do we bring this stuff back? And that's and and I'm kind of getting back to vinyl in a sense, because if you press vinyl and sell it, the artist actually makes the money. Exactly. Whereas if you're you know dealing with a you know Apple and Spotify. You're not making shit. No, you're not. You're you're making, are, you get 14,000 downloads, you get 11 cents. It's ridiculous. Yeah. And, uh, you know, try to plug that into a divorce court. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, <laughs> I, I, look, that. it's not going to listen, man. I mean, um, this obsession. I mean, again, you have impeccable time. I just, um, you know, I guess I just, uh, my true colors are coming out. And it's just, I, the, the, the Jimmy, I just can't get out of this, this, this. This Jimmy Lovelace, Joe Morello, maybe Morello's not the best example. Philly Joe. I mean, these guys were dancing on the on the drums, just dancing oh, away. God. It was unreal. And I know also. Um, well, actually, this is a question for you. Um, how did you? I mean, Glenn Johns. I don't know if you ever worked with Glenn, but like I did, I it, did work with Glenn. Okay, so he had this really old school because John Malo, uh, Mila, the guy out of Chicago, very old school engineers. They used to mic um, the left and right overhead and maybe one mic on the bass drum. And to me, it, it, when you listen, you talk about vinyl. Um, when you listen to some of the vinyl, because not every single part of the drum was was mic'd, there was like this incredible leakage and I, and I'm not a fan of leakage, but I think a little bit is, it just, there was something about the way the, what's the best way in your mind to mic the drums? I mean, you could, if you wanted to mic every single drum today, but then again, well, 
It, it is, it, I, I need space. I need silence. I need leakage. I, that, that's what I need. You know, what, what do I know? I'm, not, you know, I'm just trying well, to... I mean, you know, a, a friend of mine, Dave Weckl, uh, mics everything, and um, yeah. we'll, we'll just leave it at that. Uh, <laughs> in, 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 my, in my studio here, I actually had four drum sets fully mic'd. Now I'm only using one. Good. But one of those sets was uh, a 1942 Leedy with a 20-inch bass drum, and I wouldn't mic it like Glenn Johns. What you do is you take the left overhead, yeah. and it goes directly over the snare drum, like 32 inches, right. or you, you come up with a figure. And then you take that swing and swing that 32 inches to the right of the right floor tom, and that the right overhead mic is off the floor tom's axis wow. at, at the same exact inches. And then you have a kick and a snare mic, and that's it. And you that's four it. Microphones. And that's four it. Microphones. That's it. And it, and sounds, it sounds ridiculous. Glorious. Oh. You so, just, you just, I mean, you just really made my day, man. Like you just made my. Like that. Well, now, why do you now? So that's the question: is what. Glenn is obviously in a, in a class by himself, but why do you feel, I mean, do you feel like, isn't it just like the idea of saying, well, because we have the technology, we have to use the technology. We have to mic everything as opposed to like, why not? Why can't people, I guess that's my point is that I want to make sure that my daughters, and they certainly understand this because of the music that we listen to in the house and on, in the car. But I mean, there's just like, They've, my younger generations have had digital beats crunched into their ears, so they don't really know or they cannot tell or detect the authenticity of a Glenn Johns mic drum kit. So I'm just trying to figure right. out, is, is, right. it, is it just the, the idea that, well, we have all the candy, why not use all the candy? I mean, because I think we're really, what we're really talking about in some ways is less is more. I mean, I think that's what you're talking about with this with this drum kit. I mean, it, 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 it is totally that way. Yeah. And and I still work with great engineers. You know, we just lost the great Ed Cherney uh, last week, which was very very depressing. Yeah, I he saw was, uh, that. He was the engineer. Uh, you know, just as such a, a rock star on his own. But he was the first second engineer I ever worked with here in Los Angeles with uh, Michael Jackson and Quincy Jones and Bruce Woodin. So Eddie and I go way, way back, wow. and there were there were there were concepts like Alan sides. Instead of let's say you have two rack toms up top and two floor toms, like Steve and I have the same setup. You know, a lot of guys just put one rack up, and if I'm doing like with David live, I'm only using one rack. Uh, but you could get away with using one tom mic between those two and one tom mic between the floor toms. Exactly, and, and that that cuts out phasing issues, and it cuts out. Uh, makes your toms speak. You know, God forbid you have to learn how to tune your drums. As a drummer <laughs> exactly. In today's times. Can you point me to some records that you were on where you know where this this magical uh, play, mic placement? Because I, you know, Korchmar hit me to that. By the way, did you were you hip to the? It was kind of like your. I don't know where you were. Kind of like Rufus and Shaka, mid seventies, but. Uh, Keltner was telling me about you know, David Foster before he became you know super famous. Uh, they had a band called Attitudes. Um, it was Foster, Cooch, Keltner, and um, Paul Stallworth, this monster bass player. They used to they they cut a couple of albums, so I just wasn't sure if you were hip to the the you know Foster pre pre stardom. I, I knew David loved Keltner because he played on uh, yeah. Um, dr- uh, uh, fuck, what's that record? Uh, well, this band Attitudes, you got to check it out. It's fucking great. And and David Foster's playing his ass off. But are there? Can you point me to a couple of albums, J.R. Robinson albums, where this mic it may not have been a glint, you know, where the miking technique really plays out. It was it was it was sparse. It was quality over quantity because what well, the point is that Korchmar was like Jake. I used to think it was an analog digital issue. And he's like, right. it has nothing to do. With, he goes, that's not it. He goes, it's how how you mic the room. It's how you mic the the instruments. It's it's what it is. There's so many recordings. And I know. I'm very I know. Blessed to even say that, but we did a whole series of uh, Sheffield Lab records. Oh my dude, I love those, dude. I, I did. You know, God bless uh, Doug Sachs who passed. Mm. But you know, that was with Alan Sides and. Uh, um, uh, 
Bill Schnee. Yeah, Sh- and, Schnee, uh, yeah, yeah, Schnee, legend. Uh, we, got, we did about ten records. And I know Jeff Picaro did some before I got involved. And those records were all recorded and mastered live. Mixed and mastered live. Exactly, exactly. And, 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 and if you can find uh, anything from Sheffield Labs... They're, they're, I know they're very expensive on vinyl. Well, I, I'm just trying to get an idea because I, I I have a lot of Lincoln Mayorga, but that's bef- that's pre JR. This is more like '80s Sheffield Lab stuff. Yeah, it was all '80s all the way all the way into maybe '88 was the last. Wow. One. And, and so what? And, and like, who's the leaders on? The, who are the leaders? Yeah, are... There was like a David Benoit one. Wow. There was, uh, wow. wow. There was. Uh, I don't know if Dave Cause. They were you know they were they were basically pre. Smooth jazz is what they were. Exactly. I love it. I love this. I need to find and, those and immediately. It was, it was some hip shit. And, uh, uh, you know, as far as the rock stuff goes, I mean, I cannot remember. I, I know I worked with them two or three times, which was Glenn Johns. And uh, I, I don't know if it was at Sunset Sound 2 in the back or, I, I, honest to God, can't remember. Was it Capital? I can't remember. But, um, uh, there's a lot, it's, it's a lot, dude. I, I know, I know. I, you know, but you just, you know, when when they when they pop into your memory, shoot me an email. I just want to hear that that I will. because you know, there's a Bernie Ledden uh, post Eagles did a um, he had Neil Young's he was he had Neil Young's house and uh, or he had moved in there and they had a, a studio downstairs. David Kemper was on drums. And, wow. And it's from like '77. Uh, it's called Natural Progressions. Um, it is the, I mean, I'm not saying it's, you know, no one's going to mistake this for, you know, freaking, you know, these guys weren't trying to be, you know, fusion players, but I mean, the, the sound of the drums and the bass is insane. And when I interviewed Kemper, he said it was a right and left overhead mic and maybe one for the bass drum. That was it. And it breathed. The music was breathing, man. on On the pointer sister stuff. Uh, right. like I'm so excited was was done uh, very a very limited uh, mic setup, but it's very very fat. Right, fat is the right. You're you're nailing this. This is unreal. I mean, and I and, and I and I listen. I always had, you know, at the same time, Stuart Copeland was cranking a snare drum up so high it would scare the living shit out of anybody. <laughs> plus, plus what it does is it'll, it, it 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 opens up space. For all the air around where two and four is, it's a whole other ball game. Exactly. So I, I would be doing the opposite. I would be tuning fat, and uh, and creating the snare drum actually creates a space which dictates what the groove is and what the what the vibe's going to be. You know. Um we got to do part two. I got um, down real soon. We've been cooking here for 71 minutes. I just, I wanted to, as we wrap up set one here with J.R. Robinson, I, I kind of wanted you to talk about, I'm always fascinated with this. I see a lot of rhythm sections sometimes. They, uh, younger cats, they're very obsessed with the idea. They're like saying, you know, um, you know, where's the one? You know, where's the downbeat? Where's the one? Where's the one? Where's the one? And, and you know, you'd have guys like, uh, you know, James Jamerson yelling out back in the day, you know, any note can be the one. And, like, it, and, 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 you know, I wanted you to talk a little bit about your concept of the idea that, like, this Bill Maxwell said, he goes, you know, I understand what Jamerson meant. He goes, he meant anywhere in the bar line could be the emphasis note where the feeling of the music is. It could be on the end of three. It could be on four. Or at the end of five, if it's in five four time, any note could be the emphasis note. That could be right. the one to them. If you're doing three four 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 five four seven eight, there's a legitimate one to each one of those bars. But that doesn't mean everyone has to play that. It really depends on the melody and how the melody is going, and the emphasis note on the bar. Can you point to a time that I mean, do you do you follow that philosophy? Was there a band that you were in at any point in your career where that 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 sort of came into play where um, you know, the emphasis note on the bar line could free up that any note could be the one. Ah, well, uh, that would probably eliminate Rufus and the Brothers Johnson. Because, <laughs> because that, the, the, both of those two bands evolved into dance bands. 
uh, without selling your soul. Um, right. Although I think I, I mean, I think I could dance to uh, to the to music from Kaleidoscope with David Lindley. I could dance to anything. But go ahead. <laughs> yeah, 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 go ahead. Yeah. Uh, by the way, my mother when when Woodstock came out, and I was only fifteen. Right. Uh, there was a cat with a fucking milk truck uh, that would drive around town, and we, we know what they were doing in the truck. <laughs> and, and he had just bought Woodstock and somehow was playing. It must have been on a track. Oh, my God. I was playing it in this milk truck, and my mother, Helen, God bless her, she was don't you go in there? Well, you know what they're doing in there? I go, I know what they're doing in there. They're listening to fucking Woodstock. <laughs> and I go, I'm going. And, you know, I had ordered mine through, like, Montgomery Wards or something. Cause Columbia, the, the, yeah, the right, final. right. So I would go hang out with these guys. It's just I had to bring up that story. Oh, uh, I love it. I, you know I mean? Just, you know what it's like? Like, Kaleidos, like uh, you know, that was, I was just hanging out with, with Barry Melton, better known as the fish from Country Joe and the Fish, and he was like. Sure. He's like, man, he's like, um. He's like Kaleidoscope was the most amazing band with Lindley, Paul Lago, Lagos, and those guys. He's like, but but he's like, you, he's like the problem with them. You couldn't dance to that music, you know. And I was like, I don't know. I think I could. You know, when you say dance band, I know what you mean. But man, yeah. I just love to let the body dance. And I think that you know, it's like freedom of expression, man. Like it doesn't have to be. Anyway, was there a free? Was there a band collectively where you guys even before you kind of got into the the zone, so to speak, in the mid early to mid seventies where, you know, it was free yeah. and, and you guys were just playing off. Yeah, yeah. I, I had a bunch of free free form jazz bands. Uh none of them I, I'm actually not in touch with any of them. There was one band I had which was a Miles Davis clone band called Balls, B A L Z. <laughs> and and uh, it, it was a, Dude, it was where a are the tapes of that? Where are the tapes of that band, dude? I need to hear it that. was well it was uh, the Mike Polera was the piano player. Wow. He lives down in New Orleans. Holy. He was just a bad. He was very much a Bill Evans wow. disciple, Jeez. and uh, so that we we did a whole bunch of work. And uh, then I started playing with Tiger Okoshi, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, ended up, you know, you end up kind of conforming to make money in Boston. So, you know, what, the things I learned from him. I did his senior recital at Berkeley with John Lockwood. And uh, um, it was, there were three pieces of music or odes, and one of them, there weren't even notes. He had written it as uh, painting and symbols. Beautiful. And like uh, drawings, and how do I interpret that on the drum set? And uh, wow. so I, I'll, I'll, never, I'll never forget that. And uh, so, that, I mean, that was very avant garde. And John Laporte, I gave a standing ovation, and blah, blah, blah. But, uh, you know, then leading after that, you know, you start doing gigs. I mean, you know, later when I got with George Duke and Stanley Clark, uh, we were still, there was still a groove-based stuff on there. And, and funny, after we had cut Sweet Baby uh, on the first record, which was a number one record, Stanley always asked me, he goes, JR, is, is my bass part okay? <laughs> Is my bass? I go. You're fucking. At, you're Stanley Clark. You're asking me if your bass part's okay. I go. Yeah, your bass part's great. He goes. Well, I just. I, you know, it's it's kind of a real choked R and B thing. I, I, I Stanley, it's fine. It's great. Wow. You know, I'd like. Damn, I felt so big at that moment. <laughs> but uh, yeah. you know, I just the different things I've gone through, and you know, Peter Frampton in the mid '90s was uh, very glorious. And, uh, but, you know, as far as time dimension uh, and that sort of thing, you feel it as a band, I guess. Exactly. Where's the pulse? You know, did you, by the way, did, did you, you know, your, your, your story about basketball harkened back to an interview I did with the great John Molo, who, when he was, um, when he was unemployed, he used to shoot hoops with all the unemployed actors and musicians. Did you? Did you? Yes. Did you cross paths with the Wiley Molo? Have you? You, you know? I that? believe we did. We did at some point at somewhere because I remember hanging with him. Oh, that's great. You know, you guys are all long, part long of the great. Uh, you know, I mean, Jr. I'd love to. I'm going to be on the road next week, but when I get back, can we do set two? I would love to do set two. Do I have time to uh, plug a couple of things? Oh, go, dude, hit it, man. Okay. Uh, Two days ago, I scored my first movie, and the movie is called The Bronx, USA. 
and it's about George Shapiro's life. Wow. And, and uh, so that's on HBO right now. So everybody tune in to the, the Bronx, USA. Can you, can uh, you talk to the to, – there, there are cats that are going to immediately reach out and say, who's George Shapiro? Who, can you, can you George break – George Shapiro uh, was an uh, agent and a manager back in the golden days – and then turned out to be a major producer and discovered and produced Seinfeld. Dead. And as we well know, Seinfeld is the biggest comedy show ever. Ever. Uh, ever. 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 And, and, it, and it, it and hits it's all Democrats. It's running. unreal. It's, unre- it's unreal how that thing hit. That, that target fan base is like 13 to 90. It's unreal. Ex- exactly. And, he, and, he, and, and I, you know, I went to the Dodger game with him a month ago. And I got to tell you, he was, he's 89, and I could barely keep up with the guy. <laughs> so it was fantastic to work for the guy and the great director, Danny Gold. So Beautiful. So that's out now. And, uh, you know, you're talking about Cooch and Keltner. I was just with them. Oh, over. boy. Oh, boy. Uh, I just got inducted into the Rock Gods Hall of Fame. Is that what it's called, Rock and, Gods? Or the, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a new one. Oh, it's a new one. All right, yeah, yeah. And then, uh, you know, Rufus and Shaka is, we're still up for a nomination for Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but that looks a little bleak, as always, so we don't know about that. And um, I, don't get, I don't get off on awards anyway, man. I mean, it, to me, it's like, this is like, well, anyway, I, I, I dig. I, also, I want to I tell you, man, I want to send you a link. I, I would be humbled. This book um, is full. Oh, definitely. This book is full of Keltner and Cooch, and you are going to die when you're going to – you know what it is? I want you to – you know, for me, this book, um, I want you to be be able to to open it um, on a morning when you're dragging a little bit, and you read one excerpt from uh, Dennis Coffey or from the late Ndugu Chancellor or a vignette from Keltner, and you get inspired – to get on fire for the day, man. And pretty soon, I mean, this is only volume one. So, Jr., you're going to be in it at some point. It's you know, but it, it really to be, you know, you you are a master timekeeper, somebody who's rooted in the Joe Hunt, um, Alan Dawson, um, angular rhythms. And I just I ha- I have to believe, at some point, I'm not saying that's going to come back and make millions of dollars, but there's got to be something in the commercial viability of angular individualistic rhythm in, in, in our culture at some point in our civilization. I, I, I pray and I think you're one of the you're one of the bridges to it, man. But it, it was just it was just great to hang with you, brother. Well likewise I appreciate the reach out and it's uh, an honor, Jake, to, to, to be part of your family. And uh, <laughs> cons- consider uh, uh, round two uh, on. Yeah we're on but yeah I'll re- I'll I'll get you a copy of this uh, later today. I'll be transcribing some of the salient stories but um yeah, much love to you, brother, and uh, rock gods. Rock on, man. Hey, and I'm around uh, for most of the end of the year here, so. Yeah, no, we'll, 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 get, I'm gonna, we'll get it together when I get back. We'll do set two. We got more to do. You got it, Jake. All right, buddy. Love you, man. All right, love you, too. Bless you, brother. Take care. Later. Later. Wow, what a beautiful, beautiful hang with J.R. Robinson. Um, that's it for the Jake Feinberg Show today. We'll be back tomorrow. Until then. Peace.